Well, good morning, everyone. So over the past decade, a number of companies has grown up around open source software to install and configure Unix-like computers. Reductive Labs, Opscode, CF Engine, now SaltStack and Ansible, and more. Uh, these are hardly new, um, or it's hardly a new thing to have configuration management companies. As pointed out, Microsoft has been in the game quite a long time. Uh, Opsware, Blade Logic, Tivoli, of course, was early in the 1990s. We know these companies, and along with a whole stack of other companies like Computer Associates and all of the middle, middleware-oriented companies that were brought about over the past probably 20 years. So the idea of uh, companies that run configuration management software is not new. But what perhaps is new is this uh, change of open source innovation starting companies and bringing some of the in innovations from the past 10, 20 years of open source into the fray of this. And this touches on a number of interesting issues, one of which is um, trust. We're bringing businesses into the fray. What does that mean for uh, other companies? Does it make it easier to trust tools if a business is standing behind them? Uh, are we happy to trust just open source software pulled randomly from people's net websites? What does it mean for our ability to build sustainable and uh, reliable tools for business and for society as a whole? Business too, of course, has been changed by open source. We've seen huge uh, changes in the, in the willingness of companies to take aboard uh, the ideas of open source uh, software, the kind of community-based innovation, an idea, um, the feedback that comes from having a large community surrounding tools. Companies like Puppet, for instance, have made uh, impressive efforts in reaching out to the world of community and bringing in their, um, their opinions. So I want to talk about some of these challenges and try to sketch out what I think some of this stuff might mean to us as an industry. Um, and what perhaps businesses can do to better support the world in terms of technology as time goes forward. These questions are not easily answered, and many of us in this audience are probably coming more from the open side, the more research side, um, and are perhaps even a little skeptical that businesses have something to offer. So to do that, I really want to sketch out a little bit about what I see first of all as being the challenges of the industry. What are the challenges we're trying to face? What are the businesses going to try to solve? And then say a little bit about how companies can um, bring something unique, which we haven't perhaps had before, to the, uh, to the stage. I need my water. Hmm. Small slide malfunction here. Let's see if this uh, helps. <coughs> we seem to be having some uh, VGA troubles. There <laughs> should be a pretty picture on this slide, I'm sorry. All right, so here's the thing. So quite soon, the world's information infrastructure will have reached the point where the level of scale and complexity is so high that it will force scientists and engineers to think about it in an entirely new way. We simply haven't had models of infrastructure that can cope with the kinds of structures that we're building today. Not just hundreds of machines, thousands of machines, but tens of hundreds, millions of machines in orchestrated infrastructures on a global basis. These are challenges that we have never had to face before in the history of the universe, and we've never really had to think about how to do that. I remember very early on in the history of LISA when I was uh, first attending, there was a paper with the title something like, How to Install 100 Computers and Still Have Time to Mow the Lawn. And then 10 years later, there was a paper, How to Install 1,000 Computers and Still Have Time to Mow the Lawn. Last year, one of the people in our company suggested to me that I hold a talk, How to Install 100,000 Computers and Still Have Time to Mow the Lawn, which reminded me of the first paper. But I think what this shows is that over those 20 years, we haven't actually gotten very far in thinking about how to do it differently. 
what we've tried to do is, in fact, introduce tools that brute force existing old-fashioned, relatively old-fashioned methods into a, or sort of shoehorn them into the challenges of the new uh, decade. But that is not really the way to solve uh, problems. We need to look at it in an entirely new way. So what you almost can see on, on the slide is that we're really approaching the time when engineers have to take on the challenge of making infrastructure smarter so that it can configure, install, and maintain itself to a much larger degree. And also much easier to use for consumers, users of this infrastructure, so that they actually know how to uh, interface with this infrastructure in a reliable way that society can build upon. We cannot be fiddling around in the back rooms, hacking things together, hoping to get people to adapt to the infrastructure that we care to build. It has to be much more commoditized, much more uniform, and much more expected for people in society if we're going to be able to uh, approach it in a way that will support ordinary people in their lives. So the devices we connect, the network patterns, the applications, uh, all of these things need a level of interoperability that make them easy to plug together into interesting and functional infrastructures. And of course, we need interoperability between people, uh, not only the users, but the people who maintain and groom, uh, install these infrastructures. We've seen a transition in the networking industry, for example, from uh, you know, mad rocket scientists who couple wires together and plug things into boxes and tw tweak knobs and, and build this ad hoc network to a split of the industry into cable guys, people who deliver, um, who, who install a cable in your house and plug in a set-top box or something like this. And then, of course, a data center or network operation center where skilled engineers actually manage a large number of installations over a wide area with greater expertise. This kind of transformation is very business-like. Commodity stuff, high-level engineering. And as we do this, we raise up uh, the level of the stack um, and bring a certain amount of uh, maturity into, into products. And I think that's what we, are, what we need to look at today. But there's another thing, and that is that the rate of change of infrastructure that we need to see is, in, is accelerating. And that's because, of course, uh, information technology allows us to change to, um, to bring about new services very quickly. Businesses are changing very quickly. The cloud, for instance, is the, the primordial soup of businesses where you can go in and set up a brand new business in a few minutes. You know, business in a box, bang. You've got a mail server, you've got a um, user base, you've got a website, all in the space of a few minutes. And companies can uh, grow and fail all at the same time, in the space of a day, if you like. The turnover is very fast, the agility is very fast, and that need for change, rapid change, puts burdens on the way the infrastructure is developed and how it should perform. So we need a much more dynamic infrastructure than we've ever had in the past. Now, what we've seen happen is that increasingly developers are getting involved in this because developers are involved in creating websites, creating the value of businesses. And this is a mixed blessing. The programmability of infrastructure introduces increased fragility into infrastructure. The days of simple, robust tools are possibly um, diminishing at the moment, but I hope they will be coming back because in order to, to really rely on infrastructure, it has to be immutable, predictable, reliable, dependable, not programmable. The more programmable it is, the more likely it is that we will be able to make some of these spectacular mistakes that Chris was uh, alluding to. So what does the industry look like today? Well, it no longer looks like it did when I wrote uh, Programming the BBC Micro. <laughs> um, We've gotten past the idea of a single, you know, I remember when I was in college, we had a bunch of uh, PCs on desks, and then there was a file server in the room and a printer server, and we would send our jobs to the printer server at the corner of the room, and this was somehow um, 
considered to be networking. Today, of course, it, computing looks very different. And from the image, you see some of the, the areas in which uh, we have to deal with operating systems that require configuration. This is an old slide that I pulled from a CF Engine presentation, hence the little logos on them. But you see some of the areas where we've actually uh, installed CF Engine. Everything from supercomputers to cloud to uh, television sets. You know, my, the last two TVs that I've had at home have both been Linux machines, as attested to by the GNU public license that falls out of the box when you open the packaging. Uh, Android phones, we've had CF Engine on Android phones, um, embedded device, you know, Raspberry Pi. Uh, Home routers, I think that's a microwave oven. I don't think we've ever had CF Engine on a microwave oven, but, but refrigerators have Linux machines in them these days. You know, technology is spreading to all the things. Uh, it's not just commercial or industrial or enterprise level hardware, but also home domestic uh, hardware. And that proliferation demands a new way of attacking configuration that is much more distributed, much more um, much simpler for, for users to interact with. So uh, the thing that's changed is that IT has become a platform for business, for, for society. And it means we need to have a, an environment that we can rely on and trust, and that the infrastructure has to become more pervasive, more decentralized. Even today with the cloud, uh, we're seeing concentrations of computing power in data centers. We're building more data centers. As these data centers grow and grow, they will eventually spill over into the very um, world in which we live. I can perfectly imagine that in five to 10 years time, we will have a little cloud station next to the electricity meter in our homes where we can download our, you know, our local cache. Uh, what we call today the CDNs, the content delivery networks that are essentially a cloud spanning the planet, uh, redistributing cached uh, information content. All of this belongs to the same kind of infrastructure. These will all become the same thing, and they will become much more pervasive than they are today. We need ways to handle that level of complexity. We haven't begun to see that today. Today, we see brilliant engineers holding essentially fragile architectures together by ingenuity and brute force. We do not see technologies that are intrinsically dependable, immutable, reliable, stable in a way that we really need to make them mission critical and for society to depend on. So how are we going to manage this? And what is the human experience going to be? Well, I think there are three things that should be keeping us awake at nights. And that is scale, complexity, and what I'll call comprehension. And scale is quite obvious. We've already said that um, the number of machines is growing very, very fast because, of course, businesses are increasingly using IT and increasingly need to use it. And the more we use it, the more we see applications for it. So it tends to grow all by itself. Just maintaining scale is, uh, is a challenge in itself, uh, a dynamical challenge, a challenge of engineering, a challenge of handling bottlenecks, um, bringing about redundancy, reliability, um, handling geography. How many of you have typed in um, a tweet on your phones only to go to your PC and find that it's not there? And it appears sometime in the next half hour because when you connect to Twitter or Facebook or one of these social media sites by your mobile device, you end up being pointed to a different data center than the one that serves your PC. And these things only have eventual consistency. They gradually converge towards the same state, but it takes time. These are issues of relativity that come about when you try to scale things up to a large size. So keeping the foundation strong while building massive scale and keeping a consistent user experience is not a trivial challenge at all. We've seen innovations from companies like Google and Amazon and so on who have handled some of these things uh, surprisingly well. But we still see um, cracks in the armor, so to speak, or places where things are not entirely consistent. There's still some way to go. We haven't fixed it yet. That in itself brings about complexity. 
complexity comes from many sources, and we tend to abuse the word complexity, in fact, to mean all kinds of different things. Complexity, I believe, is something that comes about when through the interconnections between uh, devices and between people. I mentioned the term interoperability before. How do things interact? When you have many vendors, many competing technologies, whether they're commercial or not, with differing standards, getting these things to work together in a seamless way is a challenge. It, that in itself brings about sort of cracks in the armor and unreliabilities. On the other hand, bringing about global standards too soon stifles innovation and prevents people from moving on to the next thing. This conflict of interest has been at the heart of the industry for years. So if we look at networking technologies, for example, they have been stuck on standardization for a long time, and we've seen very little innovation in networking devices. On the server side, very little standardization. We've seen huge uh, advances in um, what's, for example, Linux. The whole open source community has opened up the doors to innovation, <laughs> let down the floodgates. I was often speak about this kind of Berlin Wall moment when you know, when the, the big corporation wall fell down and open source minions were allowed to flood in and bring about a new era of, uh, of innovation and commerce. Open source, in, ironically, enabled commerce in, uh, in the world of IT from a free sort of open concept, breaking down the barriers that commercial organizations had set up. It's kind of ironic, and Richard Stallman would be unhappy to notice that uh, Today, what people think of as open source is not so much free speech as free beer. We see open source as being an opportunity to avoid paying for something rather than um, using it in a way that is uh, creative and open and creating something for interoperability. So complexity, very difficult to handle. It comes from all kinds of different places, but absolutely necessary to handle. If we don't handle complexity, we could end up building a house of cards that could crash down at any time. We've seen some of these houses of cards. Uh, the major outages from Amazon, from Netflix, and so on. I believe these things come about because we're building essentially old-fashioned, fairly brittle and rigid architectures, but trying to keep them together by working very, very fast and very, very hard around them. Little swarms of men running around and women, of course, people running around these uh, these systems, keeping them together by brute force, making sure the cards don't move too much. What this does is it creates a monster that is very hard to comprehend. Massive scale, massive complexity over geographical distances. And so that becomes a problem for comprehension. How do we understand, how do we see, comprehend, take in the monsters we create? Very, very hard. And the state of the art of monitoring systems, for example, is no better than it was 20 years ago. We've really come absolutely nowhere when it comes to observing, understanding, and monitoring uh, computer systems and orchestrating them. I'll come back to that in a little minute. So it's really a fragile house of cards that we're in the process of building. And unless we sort out the ways of configuration, um, building and maintaining in stable ways for society, we won't be able to, to rely on this stuff. All right, so what are the industry's challenges? How do industries' businesses see this? What do they want? Well, any kind of business wants from its uh, IT infrastructure dependability. And what's often hard for us to understand is that businesses are not, they don't care about IT. They care about their business purpose. They're selling shoes or cars or, or manufacturing parts or Perhaps even they're selling computers or they're selling apps, but they're not selling IT infrastructure. That IT infrastructure is supposed to blend into the walls. It's supposed to become part of the subway, the, the cabling under the street, the heated road surfaces, all of these things that we take for granted in the rest of the world. We still haven't managed to make IT infrastructure disappear from view yet. We can see if we look around the room, uh, wireless devices hanging from the ceiling, uh, it, it hasn't disappeared yet, but it needs to do that. To advance the cause of business, what you want is dependable services that support the business, not services for their own right, 
no business cares about LDAP or, or Active Directory or, or even HTTP. They care about selling shoes or, or clothes or whatever it is that they're doing. What they want is value for low cost because IT is generally seen as a cost center. And they need speed and agility in the market because the market is moving very quickly today because of IT. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that means that we often have a problem with confidence. We want to have confidence in our, in our infrastructure. We want to know that our business is going to be reliable and dependable. We want low risk because risk ain't good. And business people don't like risk and they won't pay for risk. So this is a challenge for IT to, to build dependability. The other thing we want, of course, is freedom. So the problem with the large vendors before this Berlin Wall moment of, of open source is that uh, there was no freedom to innovate. You are locked into Microsoft's vision or IBM's vision or Oracle's vision or whatever this was. And it was only when that wall could come down that we were able to start to try other things, play around with different kinds of systems. So the, the, the role of business in an IT infrastructure is kind of subtle, and it can play both ways. We need to figure out how businesses best can support uh, the challenges of IT without putting up barriers. We're actually learning some of these lessons, I believe. It's quite an exciting time. So here's my picture. I'm glad this picture came out, at least. Uh, this is my picture of what I see uh, as how we have managed infrastructure in the past. We've, be, we've gone from hunter-gatherers. Uh, we've been hunter-gatherers. What we've done is we've grown IT infrastructure for its own sake, kind of raw, wild. We've built up systems, made them bigger and bigger. They've grown in all directions. And we kind of pick berries from them, pick fruits. You know, this, the IT infrastructure can make this. It can be a database. We can pull data from this thing. But it's been often rather ad hoc. We need to get from that randomly grown stuff that seems to give us some fruits to the stage where we can manage the infrastructure, plan it out in a way that's efficient, farm it in a, in a, in a way that can maximize yields and bring about efficiencies of scale. These things we've learned how to do in agriculture. The manufacturing industry is also much better at this than we are in IT. In IT, we're 40 years behind these other things, at least. But we need to learn some of these lessons. We might perhaps look at cloud as being uh, something like this, a way to manage resources in a more predictable way, a, a way to put things more tidily on the shelves. Um, however we look at it, there's clearly a challenge to solve in moving from this kind of uh, uh, ad hoc state to a more managed state, managed state. I believe that the way we do this is to look at relationships. And I, I sort of stumbled across this point when I was at DevOps days in Rome uh, some, some months ago and realized that there's a basic thing here which everybody knows deep down, but we rarely put our finger on. And that is that the, the heart of business, IT, technology, human interactions, all of these things. The bottom of all of these things is, is a learning relationship, which is an interaction. So in this picture, I tried to show interactions between machines and machines, between people and people, and between people and machines. Machines need to talk to each other because we have technologies that need to interact. We break things down into different parts, different components, networks, servers, software pieces, um, services that depend on other services. These things need to be able to plug together and talk to each other. So clearly, technology needs to be able to talk to technology. And that needs to be a continuous interaction. Similarly, uh, humans working together need to talk to each other. This is part of the message that I think DevOps is trying to, <laughs> trying to uh, emphasize today. So for, in order for people to work together, we have to talk to each other, not just once. You don't just shout your command and, and hope it will, be, it will be done. You have to have a continuously bonded relationship with someone to build up trust, uh, to be able to work effectively together. What that does is it builds up um, knowledge. Knowledge is not 
stuff you read in books. It's not stuff you look up on Google. Knowledge is a relationship that you have with something that you do, you, something that you interact with. When you talk about people you know, your friends, you're thinking about people that you haven't just met in the street, not somebody that you talk to. When you talk about a friend, you're talking about somebody that you interacted with many times. You know them. You've learned their foibles, their quirks. You have expectations of how they're going to behave. And you know how you can get something out of them. You know how to use them, employ them. Similarly, when we use a tool, uh, we don't say we know Emacs, having used it once. It's only after having used Emacs for several centuries that we start to know all of the, the keystrokes and menu items and scripting possibilities and so on that are inherent in such a complicated piece of software. We need to build a relationship with it. Learning is a relationship. Even when we read a book, uh, sometimes we you know, cram for exams and so on, but we don't really know that stuff. We only know it when we use it on a day-to-day -day basis and have a relationship with it. Recently, DevOps has come to the fore, emphasizing that if we want to bring uh, software to the people more rapidly, then developers and operations people need to have that kind of relationship, not just hand over, throw it over the wall and hope for the best and leave the problem with somebody else. But we need to have a continuous dialogue going on so that Developers know what to expect of capabilities of operations people. Operations people know what they're likely to expect from the developers. And that continuous dialogue brings about some sort of consistency learning. It's a learning process. Now, it has to go between machine and machine, humans and humans, and humans and machine. And the technologies we create to, to help this have to support those interactions. They cannot just take away an interaction from the humans. Automation is not about removing human from a loop. It's about making sure that the human fits into the right part of this diagram. That the dialogues we are having between people and people, machines and machines, and humans and machines, are the right ones. That we're not talking about things we don't care about. We're maximizing uh, the value of those relationships to the processes that we're trying to bring about. This might seem obvious, but honestly, when I look around at the way network operation centers are run and how system administration is done around the world, I can say that this is absolutely not obvious to, to people. This is perhaps the one thing that most people are missing out on. Because we get so focused on the job we're trying to do, on one particular relationship, like you know, if I were to take a show of hands, I bet you guys spend more time typing into VI than you do with your families on an average day. That's a closer relationship you have to VI than you have to your partners or whatever. Let's hush that up very quickly. <laughs> um, but that's an important thing. It means we tend to focus, we tend to get blinkers, and we tend to focus too much on a particular part of the job and not see more of the bigger picture. But we, in order to be a component in a larger system, we need to fit in. And so the technologies we build uh, to handle scale complexity and comprehension, these things need to encourage the right kinds of relationships in organizations. Let me give you an example. So I like this picture. I discovered it uh, around 2006 when my friend uh, Claudio Bartolini from HP uh, got interested in the idea of business alignment in, in systems. And, and actually, Carolyn and I wrote some uh, books about this. I love this picture because it shows, so this is a picture of an Ariane rocket next to a 747. And for me, this is uh, the illustration of how to get from rocket science to commercial aviation, or if you like, uh, immature technology to mature technology. In system administration, we are rocket scientists, still. We bring together expertise. Probably you know, two people in the organization are capable of doing this thing, so they're rocket scientists. We put them together for a long amount of time. We build up a project which lasts weeks, months. We're aiming to create a rollout or a, on a certain launch date. We're going to roll out this massive change all in one go. It's a highly risky operation, probably many stages in this rocket. But they're all going to blast off at exactly the same time. 
a high-risk event that you've never rehearsed. You've never practiced this thing. And if you do, it's like every two years when there's a new rocket launch or a new um, flight. This is not the way to do business. How many of you would be happy flying on a rocket across the Atlantic? Not me, that's for sure. What I want is something that gets rehearsed many times a day because then I, know, I feel confident that people are going to get it right. When a rocket blasts off, it may blow up on the launch pad and there's nothing we can do except pick up the pieces and try again. Start all over again. What the 747 does is it brings the genius of business, of commercialization, to aviation. It creates something that anybody could build. Well, trained individuals could put together a 747 from kit parts, like an IKEA box, you know, flat-packed 747. You can just a couple of tools and you can put it together. They've made it that straightforward, commodity parts, repeatable. They've trained people to fly this thing. It doesn't fly itself. It's not that easy. It shouldn't be that easy because this is a dangerous thing, so we need to put it in the hands of experts, but we can train people. It's, you don't need rocket scientists. You don't need PhDs. You just need to train people. They need to have a relationship, a learned relationship with this thing. So the pilots have a relationship with the plane. The stewardesses and stewards have a relationship to the passengers. And your orchestration problems are now not about bringing parts to a rocket and then having a massive control center to blast off a payload. Your orchestration is about making sure the passengers arrive on time, that they're comfortable, that they find their places. Or maybe you want to rip out the seats on this plane and make it carry cargo, in which case you're dealing with the post office. It becomes a business problem. The problem the focus shifts from building the rocket and making something intrinsically unreliable and fragile and risky work to just being able to rely on that because you do it 10 times a day and you know it works. You just need to make sure you're doing it right and in a reliable, dependable way. This is the challenge of business. It's not about um, oversimplifying. It's not about... Um, taking away control from experts. It's simply about scaling up and making it reliable. Now, we go through a number of phases uh, in technology, which I think are kind of interesting. When we first try to solve a problem, the only thing we can do is to improvise. Okay? Humans have to come and they have to get involved. They get their hands dirty. They start connecting stuff together, playing around. This is how we innovate. We have to start like that because we don't know what we're doing. At some point, we figure out what it is we're trying to do, and we begin to uh, structure things, formalize things in a way that make them more predictable. We have procedures and best practices, and we start to make the process more machine-like. Then, seeing that it's more machine-like, we say, well, why not make a machine do it? And then we, let, then we introduce technologies that imitate the way the human did it. So there's a transition from human to machine, where machines start acting like, sorry, humans start acting like machines, and the machines copy the humans. But then there's a more mature level, the autonomous automation, where we say, you know what? Let's forget about that whole human heritage thing. Now that we understand the problem better, we can automate this in a much more efficient way if we just drop all of that uh, imitation and try to optimize the problem uh, as a technological thing. And then we reach a much more um, predictable and rehearsable uh, situation where technology can take on its true role and humans can take on their true roles much more mature. And then there's a, the only thing left to do is to sort of have redundant coverage to make sure that we have enough and that it scales and that it's, it's, uh, it's reliable. So what we end up with is a view of... Um, or well, this idea that we're moving towards an era of smart, smarter infrastructure, where IT is built into the very fabric of society. It's scaled to the point where it's very close to us to avoid these inconsistencies. It's in the walls. It's around us. It's close to us. And that means it's decentralized. It needs to be persistent. It can't be going up and down. It can't be being reprogrammed on the fly by people, by programmers in, in data centers. It's got to be persistent in order to be comprehensible. We need to be able to understand it to be able to use it. If my keyboard was changing configurations faster than I could type, 
It's not much use to me. It needs to be stable for long enough for me to use it. And the same with any kind of infrastructure. We need persistence, dis dis decentralization. And the crucial thing that everyone, I believe, is missing today is understandable. All right. So how can businesses help with this? The business of system, uh, sorry, the business of configuration management. What can businesses do to help this? Now, some of us probably have quite different ideas about what business is. There are many people in the IT world who come, for, for example, from the free, free software movement who still think of business as kind of the enemy. But over the past 20 years, I think I've, we've made huge progress in going from open source as a counterpoint to business to being a new, a new way of enabling business. And today, almost all open source projects are connected in some way to some kind of commercial uh, enterprise, all the successful ones. Some of us may think of uh, the company as a kind of sort of mafia bosses that we are supposed to pay license fees to, and this is all very, you know, uncomfortable, and it's the man, and we shouldn't be talking to these people because we are engineers. And I think that's an old-fashioned view which is dying out, as we see the realities of, inf of IT uh, become more integrated in so into society, and what we perhaps realize is that society really is about business. It's because it's about interactions, and interactions are essentially the foundation of business too, the trusted partner relationship. So this old-fashioned view is, uh, is moving apart. I like the view on the right-hand side that businesses can be leaders, uh, showing people the way forward in technology, showing us how we can go forward uh, and, take, and bring about change. And then we do it through products and services, but these things needn't be things to oppress us, things that we demand payment for, like, uh, like some sort of mafia payments. Think of it rather as us investing in a trusted relationship. We're willing to give something in order to get something back. There's a whole mindset that, that is changing even as we speak. So I like to think of technology as a way of spreading ideas. Um, Apple, for example, of course, have been a perfect example of how um, what seem to be ideas that don't exist, things people don't even need, are brought to the fore by an innovative company, and they show us leadership in the way that the world could be. Many others have done this as well, of course, but uh, Apple are the obvious example that everybody understands. When you create that kind of technology, you need to provide support for it. Uh, it needs to be funded. And just like the 747, it needs to be, <laughs> I used to hate this word, but I've become so used to it that I, that I have to say it. It has to become productized, yeah? Um, it's only when we make something consumable that it can spread to the mainstream, and that's when it becomes dependable, when it becomes mainstream. So we think of uh, businesses perhaps more as a form of leadership rather than a form of uh, extortion. And we want to productize because that brings consistency, reliability, and dependability. It's not about proprietary closure. Uh, many companies today have, have seen the light and are, are becoming much more open in what they do. But it is about being able to deliver certain promises about what we can expect. That probably means we need to relearn the economics of some of these businesses, what it is we, we you know, can take money for and how those interactions take place. Um, but there needs to be money exchanged, and this is important. Uh, an industry will not develop and mature until money changes hands. This is just how society works. Today, again, I come back to this issue that free software, open source software, I feel a bit sorry for Richard Stallman because he had this vision about free speech but when people see open source software, they, they just think free beer. This is my estimation, having been in the industry for 20 years and tried both the academic side and the business side. People think that they can save money by, uh, by putting together the parts by themselves without needing somebody to help them. I think that's a waste of time. If you're expanding your office, you don't stop your business and get everybody to go down to Ikea to buy furniture and start 
connecting, building new tables and stuff, unless you're a tiny startup. If you're a mature industry, you buy new tables that somebody's delivering, and they come and they set them up. You buy that service because it's not part of your core business goals. The goals of business are to focus on their goals, selling shoes, making cars, buying parts. It's not about building the infrastructure to do that. We shouldn't be building tools to do our jobs. We should be buying tools and, and using them to, to do what we're supposed to be doing. This is how business can impact um, the world around us. And cons configuration management is complicit in this process. We need to be part of that, uh, bringing us closer to a realistic uh, goal-oriented approach that supports businesses in their goals. So the freedom that you get in the open source and free software is also the freedom to lose focus, the freedom to make mistakes, the freedom to mess up some software that you don't have a close relationship with. The advantage of having a business looking after software is that they have that close relationship to their product. They know how to make it better. They know how people are using it. And they are doing that expertise job that you don't have time to do. This is very slow. So, you know, we, let's go back. So slow. Here we go. So in the technology configuration management industry, we have barely scratched the surface of what needs to be, to be done. Um, we've made tools which perhaps allow us to speed up what we do. But I contend that making tools simply allow, that allow us to do certain things in old ways faster is somewhat like this, uh, this nice uh, coffee advertisement. The tools are simply allowing us to do stupid things at a faster rate. We need to think rather carefully about how we make technologies that people are going to rely on. You know, the airline industry is often used as an example of a high-risk industry that people understand because you know, we all fear for our lives when we get into a, an airplane. Airplanes are not stable things. They are only ever metastable. They're held in the air by a careful balance of, uh, of forces that require responsible management from pilots, air traffic controllers, a whole range of different people, a whole orchestration problem. We are far more cavalier in the way that we deploy IT infrastructure because we don't care that much if Netflix goes down for half an hour or if Amazon is uh, absent for uh, five minutes because we'll come back. You know, we, we want the stuff so much we'll come back and no great damage was done. But when IT is responsible for hospitals and for people and for our heating and for our very lives, when Google cars are driving us to work and uh, computers literally are flying our planes 100%, then we will care very much about IT infrastructure. And we have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility, to, to move towards a more a safer platform, a more dependable platform. I believe that businesses will play an essential role in that because it's only when people are invested with real money in these problems that they will care enough to make things work. An open source developer working out of their home on a hobby project will not have that sense of responsibility to the world. How many of us would be happy to fly a plane that had been put together by a community of untrained individuals with random uh, improvements? Probably not that many. So we need to have certain standards, certain levels, and those things tend to come about by communities of businesses because businesses are about relationships and the relationships are <laughs> The relationships are the things that maintain, that bring, bring about excellence. So in the past, I've been very, I think one of my biggest um, problems with the current way that configuration management is being dealt with is that it's being pushed into the hands of programmers. Programmers are usually not experienced administ administrators, I mean operations people. They don't understand things like security because they don't live it. They don't have that relationship with it. They don't understand scalability because they don't live it. They've never put together 10,000 machines with their bare hands. 
There is a difference between dev and ops. These are not one thing, but they do need to work closely together. And we need to make systems that respect those relationships, encourage those relationships, but not, we don't gloss over those things and try to make them go away. And I think we have a responsibility to make technologies that are not made too simple. So we could, for example, make it super easy for people to deploy a whole bunch of uh, technology only to find that we've got them into a mess they can't get out of. You know, should you, is it, is it ethically right to make an aircraft extremely easy to take off and then you're up there in the air but you don't know how to land it? So getting people started without giving them a plan for how to proceed to how to land these things is almost irresponsible. So we need to be a little bit careful about this. Just very briefly, I have a, a sketch here of how I, and this is a very personal view, how I see the, the development of these technologies from the early 90s to the present day. And on, on the bottom axis, I've viewed what I consider to be a kind of progress, going from essentially managing data, a bunch of data, to having models where we understand why things are the way they are, to a more knowledge-oriented approach to administration where we not only have a model for it, but we have a relationship and where we know our systems like a friend. And this goes from push to pull. And the, the little picture of divers at the bottom here also is supposed to show that we're going from a systems, systems that are more centralized to systems that are more decentralized. So the, the centralized system, you know, the deep sea diver with his, who doesn't carry his own oxygen, he's reliant on this pipe back to central base. He's basically in a very fragile state and his, his agility is restricted. His uh, capabilities to move around uh, and to perform his work are highly restricted by this centralization, the bottleneck of the ship. On the other hand, the deep sea divers are very free. They're autonomous agents. They carry their resources with them. They've cached their oxygen, if you like. Um, and this is a much more flexible and agile and cheaper way to, to run a, a, an undersea operation. But so we have, you know, we've gone from technologies like Ardist, which w w was not on the BBC Micro, but it was uh, you know, slightly after that, where we were the sandblasting approach to administration, where we're sort of, you know, trying to blast machines into compliance from outside to a more model-oriented uh, approach, which started, I guess, with LCFG and CF Engine and these tools. The centralized systems still live, network shells, new network shells all the time, because people like this kind of hands-on feel, which works for small numbers of things. It doesn't really scale very well. So we, we have technologies that have come out of that. So Salt and Ansible are very much these sort of extensions of network shells. Uh, from CF Engine, we had Puppet and Chef, the, the inheritance of the CF Engine way of thinking, but then Puppet became more centralized again to make a simpler sort of getting started platform. And then these things sort of meander around. And then I drew this, of course, you know, because this is a CF Engine slide, I drew CF Engine in the top right in the best position on the, on the page because, of course, it's the best. Uh, and in that top right-hand corner, you really tr what I mean. The reason I made CF Engine with the design that it has today is to be able to track scale and complexity and comprehension, no less, and really push us towards knowledge-oriented systems for the first time. Without knowledge-oriented systems, we won't be able to comprehend the monsters we create, and that's really the challenge we face. Here's a challenge that we do not face at all today. Chris mentioned orchestration at the beginning. Uh, I disagree that any of the tools today we're seeing handle orchestration in a serious way. Orchestration is not do this on 10 computers and then do this on 30 computers and then add this package to 15 other computers. That is a timeline. Orchestration is not a timeline. Rimsky-Korsakov himself said that the composer should picture the entire composition in a single uh, a single design, if you like, and consider how every single voice in the orchestra works together to complete a process from takeoff to landing. A single performance is how all of the parts interoperate and have relationship with each other through the sounds they make 
through the things that they do, as well as through some sort of coordinator who is overseeing it. How many of you think that the conductor is responsible for the sound that an orchestra makes? It ain't so. The players are, the, are where the music comes from. They manage to play together because they're following a musical score. They all see the same plan. It's not because the conductor is blowing every trumpet and playing every violin. It's not because he's waving his magic wand. All of that is the light, lightest signaling, giving people some clues from a sort of network monitoring perspective. The orchestra succeeds in playing together, closely together, because they know their jobs and they have the plan in front of them how to do it. They know their part and they interoperate and they communicate through the sound that they make. This is how a data center could work. So I think uh, that's a challenge to be faced. The question is, can business help? How does business help to, to bring us uh, you know, forward in this matter? I think that the constraint of making a profit actually helps us to focus on getting a good outcome. I think that the competition between different companies drives improvements that will take us from playing jazz to being able to play symphonies together. I think that the closeness to users that uh, a business ca can have allow us to see the mistakes that people make, not just developing the tools, because you can have great tools and people can use them badly. If you can't fly the plane, it's as bad as having a bad plane. So we need to have that closeness and, uh, to users to be able to see how the world perceives the tools we make. And of course, venture money can certainly help to fund the technology, which is necessary. Um, but there are also, of course, these cultural problems, which are bridging the gap between business and IT, which is really the, the society challenge that we have to, to face with infrastructure. So infrastructure is not just for dev and ops. It's for everyone. It's for business. It's for society. And we need to figure that out. And you know, if this is good enough for George Clooney, I think this, is, uh, this should be good enough for everyone. It's not really George Clooney. So are we getting there? Well, I think progress is slow, to be honest. Uh, we're focused more on things like the cloud, which this is my picture of the cloud. The cloud is really about how to park your car in a space or put things neatly on shelves. It's an organizational issue. You know, cloud does for virtual machines what packets did for networks and what sectors did for disks. It, it allows us to, to manage space in a, in a convenient way. And we're kind of distracted by virtualization and cloud and all of these things. But what I want to see is a little bit less hacking from programmers, uh, which leads to fragility, and a little more um, focus on immutable, dependable systems from the bottom up thinking about infrastructure as something to depend on. This is the challenge that businesses have to face. We should be looking beyond making simple tools. We need to be looking at the bigger picture as well and encouraging people to adopt good practices. Infrastructure as code, I believe, is the wrong paradigm. Infrastructure as documentation is what I've been trying to say is better because we're thinking about the design, the plan, the orchestration, the, the composition. Uh, and we have to think about, are we really serving anybody ethically by you know, taking them down into a blind alley that they can't, uh, that they can't uh, follow? So you know, I've, to some extent, I think we're, we're in a little bit of a time warp that we need to get out of. And business can certainly help. So I mean, just to end, I think for me, this is about, this fits very well with uh, Alvin Toffler's vision of the future, these three waves of society and technology that he talked about. The first wave is doing everything by hand, because that's how we get started. But doing things by hand, we, we're very limited. You know, it's unreliable. We can only consume about as much as we can produce. So it's a subsistence. It's not, very, it's not a very good way to work. We're coming out of that in IT today into a second wave, which is the industrialization era, where you find a bit of technology to amplify that effort. But then just amplifying the effort of a human is just sort of mass producing the same thing. It's not very flexible. It's not very reliable. And we can make a lot of the same thing, but we tend to end up with one size to fit all, any color as long as it's black. That's not good enough today. Because we are in the third wave, the knowledge wave, 
the information society where demand, the customer demand drives the market. People want many different things and we have to be able to provide it. But this is what the information society can do. We have the technology, as Toffler said, uh, to bring about variations cheaply. Automation is not about making the same thing bigger. It's not about doing stupid things faster. It's about being able to adapt to the needs of individuals on a much more sophisticated way. That is the information society of the third wave. This is not new either. I mean, well, Toffler wrote about these ideas in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, thinking a lot about the manufacturing industry, which is still 40 years ahead of us. But, um, but these things are creeping into IT. So this is a picture from ITIL, which they call the DIKW hierarchy, moving from data to wisdom through these different stages, because they're thinking about monitoring, of course. So we start with thinking about data, numbers, stuff, don't really know what it is. Once we put it into context, you know, who, what, where, when do we need this, it becomes information, it becomes actionable information. And it's only when we have a, a knowledge a relationship with it, so, uh, you know, a continuous relationship with it, that we know how to use it for other purposes. You know, when data becomes actually valuable to us, then it becomes knowledge. And wisdom is something we aspire to. This is the way I like to draw it. This is the, the knowledge ladder. I call this the knowledge ladder. It's how companies progress from rubbing sticks together to having a purposeful, goal-oriented vision of their businesses. And on the, on the axes, we have the level of internal experience or expertise or the level of organizational maturity along the bottom. If you start out in a company not quite sure what you're doing, trying to figure stuff out. If you have a lot of internal expertise, you start doing it yourself. You can build stuff yourself, create, solve problems yourself. All is good. You're a carpenter. You can build your own furniture. And then gradually, as you become more mature, you, you automate some of it yourself, and you move towards these goals that way. But if you don't have so much internal expertise, then you may be rent as a service. You buy your furniture from IKEA. Uh, you get it from somebody who knows because your, your business can grow by doing that more cheaply. So whatever, the thing that's cheapest for you depends upon the organization you have, right? And gradually you'll see the value of, of making it more service-like and, and you'll maybe run your own service as you, be, you get your own level of expertise grows. But the key thing is you're progressing through these stages from how to do stuff, you know, how do I do this, to what it is I need to do fixing what it is, and then understanding why am I doing this? What is the purpose? And this is when we approach the idea of the goal-oriented uh, organization, the business goal that we're trying to work towards. This is the ladder that IT infrastructure needs to climb in order to bring us to the point where infrastructure and configuration can be valuable to society. And this is the ladder that businesses this is what the businesses are for, right? We are help, trying to help um, a wide community to climb this ladder. So, you know, when I began working with computer installations in the 1990s, neither computer science nor engineering had any clear idea on the subject of how to prevent computer systems from going off the rails. Gradually, we're starting to understand this. Um, it's not just about building infrastructure. It's about maintaining it. Configuration management is not just about building. It's about repair. These things have changed considerably over the past 20 years, and we've made a lot of progress. I think the area where we haven't made so much progress is in understanding that how to get from those, you know, picking fruit from, from bushes to managed farming process where we're using the infrastructure for creative purpose. And the enduring challenge of technology is to make the dialogue between humans and their tools complementary. The challenge for humans is not to stand in the way of progress, and the challenge for technology is to respect human role in that decision-making progress. There is no eureka moment at which all of this becomes right. 
it's a long, slog, long, hard slog of innovation against the forces of pessimism and inertia in the industry. And we're going to need strong companies, strong organizations with the vision and the willingness to evangelize that vision to bring about these innovative approaches. But I think that this is starting to happen, and that's where we can uh, leave the story for the time being. So thank you very much. I would be very happy to take any questions. David. So there, there's a ton of stuff in your talk, um, and I just want to ask a question about one very, very tiny part about it. Um, using agribusiness as the place you want to get to seems a little tricky to me because we're now sort of seeing the downsides of agribusiness in many different places. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you think that's just taking the analogy too far on my part, or whether you think why, yes, uh, uh, it, it's, um, it could be problematic. I'm sorry, Dave, I didn't understand this. What kind of business? Agri um, the oh, business of food, food making right. food, okay. uh, the, the, the industry of mass producing food or something that resembles food. Actually, I thought when I found this picture, let me find this picture again. When I found this picture, I thought, hey, this hydroponics farm just looks like a cloud data center. Oh, come on. God, this is so slow. Here we go. Doesn't it look like a cloud data center? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it's taking it too far. I, I wanted to make, just sort of drive the point home that we are so ad hoc today in the way that we build things. Um, even even the, you know, the darlings of our industry, the Netflixes, I believe they have a fundamentally fragile architecture which is being held together by brute force. And it's, we need to get beyond that. We need to have a more sophisticated view of, of engineering. And as I said at the beginning, we need to look at these systems in an entirely new way uh, that we've never thought about before to be able to make that happen. And, and it's almost an ethical responsibility to do it because society won't survive picking fruit from trees. We need to scale up. Whether might, that takes it too far, I'm not sure. Well, I might, I might use your notion that decentralization is actually really important to counter that argument. So I wonder. Oh, I see. OK, so I see your point, right. So certainly, um, there will probably always be large data centers, large central aggregations of stuff. But increasingly, we see things being decentralized. So for example, take power management. A few, well, say 20 years ago, it would have been inconceivable for people to have their own wind generators and their own solar panels and so on in their homes. But today, or even, you know, uh, geothermal energy <laughs> pulled out of the roots of your house, people do these things today and it's quite normal. And that will probably continue to, to, to happen. In the same way, I think that infrastructure will also um, get to the point where we have, you know, like gel packs from Star Trek or whatever in the, the walls, and these things may be biological or physical, or who knows what these things will be. The only thing we know is that they will become, they will come closer to us because they have to, because there are f certain physical restrictions like the finite speed of light that we cannot overcome. So we've got to find ways of, of short circuiting those problems, and that means decentralizing. So I'm sure, you know, scale gets handled in, in different ways. And the whole problem of scaling is complicated because you often hear companies and, and people say, such and such doesn't scale, or such and such scales better. What does that mean? You know, and Andrew Hume made this point to me years ago. You can scale anything in a centralized way or in a decentralized way, just by brute force. If you throw enough hardware and resources, you can scale anything in any way you like. The question is, how, does, how much does it cost? So you do, you do you do it cheaply, or with what properties do we scale? And I think that's 
kind of what I'm trying to get at, that we need ways that are cheap and reliable and close and have certain properties to scale. Thanks. Sure. Alexi. And to relate uh, um, this concept of the three waves of society to agriculture, which is what uh, David was asking about, um, this uh, agribusiness today, the mass production, the um, homogene uh, the same kind of product, right, produced at scale, uh, that's characteristic of the second wave. And the third wave is uh, mass customization and decentralization. And uh, uh, if you look at that particular technology, you have uh, permaculture. Um, you have uh, food forests where you can grow a lot of different um, foods in uh, very densely, right, in a small area. So the idea is you could have these uh, food gardens in cities, throughout the city, so the food would be produced locally. Uh, it would be more sustainable and healthier and less load on the environment. So to relate this back to, to computing, right, uh, don't, don't use the modern agribusiness as uh, sort of the model. It's not. This is more in the second age. Uh, we're looking forward to the third age, and we need to continue to advance. Great point. So your, um, your slide with an orchestra to talk about orchestration, um, you, you went into detail there that it, it assumes or that it requires even a, a significant degree of autonomy on the parts of the performers. Um, and in my experience, what limited autonomy is available today in our existing tools for uh, configuration management, for monitoring, for things like that, tends to be some of the more difficult features for people to wrap their minds around. You know, and Nagios itself can easily restart HTTPD if it goes down, but almost no one uses that feature. And Nagios is how many decades old and it has that, but, but everyone's scared of using it. So how do we get over that fear and that, that human reaction against handing that autonomy off to our systems to get to this picture where, where they're all working together? Excellent question. So autonomy, clearly important for scaling. I absolutely agree that it's the hardest part to understand for those people who are orchestrating uh, a system. That's one of the reasons why I identified these three problems of being scale, complexity, and comprehension. The last part, the comprehension, is something that we've done almost nothing to try to address, to make it easy for people to understand systems I believe that the only way you understand anything is by having a model of it. Um, throwing data at people is, is just dumb. And the whole concept of big data, I just wanted to bury my head uh, in shame because no serious scientist thinks, you know, like, give me more data, give me more data. They think, how can we reduce data down to something that means something? How can we extract meaning from it? I think one of the things we can look at is, for example, how does an orchestra scale? Well, uh, there are many, many people in an orchestra, but they're not all doing different things. Some of them are working as a pool, pools of resources, like first violins, second violins, woodwinds, and so on. So many of them are, are sort of redundant pools of resources. And part of the problem today is that we still think in terms of hosts. We're very host-centric in system administration whereas we probably need to be thinking more about pools of resources. Now, in order to do that, we also need software that uses pools of resources, because not all software has been written to do that, right? You can't just stick a load balancer in front of a bunch of machines and hope to scale up uh, SAP or something. So, I mean, we need developers to move towards an age where, where uh, software is written in a way that, can, that is written to support pool, pooled resources. And then we start to have a much more almost biological model of um, t tissues and materials and organs that work together. And that's fewer things. If, we try, if, you know, if a doctor tried to comprehend our body from the bazillions of cells one by one, it would be hopeless. But fortunately, we have these major organs and, and sites, because, and we have a model of it uh, which we can map out. And we have tools like s scanners that can see these things and analyze them as, you know, with their semantics understood, 
We know the heart is supposed to pump blood. We know the brain is supposed to, what's it supposed to do? <laughs> um, whatever. Um, we, we kind of know what we're looking for. And unless we know what we're looking for, unless we know the intent, as well as the feedback, the, the, the dynamics, the performance, the behavior, unless we can combine intent and what we see, actual and intended, then we'll never be able to comprehend these things. And I think that the, a lot of the innovations that I'm expecting to see have to do with uh, comprehension. Thank you. David again? So I, I loves me a good analogy. Um, and so I'm curious about the one on the slide. Um, what you think a conductor does. I, I, perhaps a conductor is the guy standing or the woman sta standing up there with the racer pistol goes Poof, and you know and then everybody goes and they go do what they're supposed to do and they know what they're supposed to do and maybe the fact that you have individual sections or you have a first violin chair and their job is to make is to keep the individual parts of the orchestra in sync within their own pool as you say. But I have seen things like TED Talks by conductors that talk about different conducting styles. And that implies to me that the conductor serves a purpose. And all the conductors I've ever met and known spend a lot of time studying the score as much as or more than the individual players studying the whole score. So I guess my question is, what do you think the purpose of a conductor is? And what do you think it should be in the purpose in, in, in this context, in this, in this context? This, the conductor certainly does have the starting pistol, when when to begin. I didn't talk too much about this because I, you know, the, the subject was business of uh, of config management. But but one of the the important things about running a system like this is that every agent in the system has incomplete information. They don't actually have the whole score in front of them. They only have their part. And so they can't see when they're supposed to come in and when they're supposed to you know, uh, start and stop very easily. And, they, they, and, and also because they're surround, you know, uh, who's the, the poor old cello or something sitting behind the tuba and he can't hear himself play, let alone think. And so he, he, he needs some hint about uh, when he needs to start playing and how loudly he should be playing because only the conductor is really in a position of overview to be able to see the whole thing. So he is the guy who manages the business goals. He is trying to deliver a performance to his audience with a certain quality and a certain consistency. And he is designing the experience for the users. The players are kind of subordinating themselves to some extent, making the most of doing their jobs. They're specialists. So they're trying to perform their tasks as part of the whole. And he's helping them to coordinate. But he's not the only, he is not a bottleneck. Because if, he, if somebody shot the conductor, they, the, the orchestra could probably continue to play for two reasons. One, because they have the music in front of them. And B, because they've rehearsed it. So again, this learning relationship, the knowledge relationship, the rehearsal, the 747 rather than the rocket, is the important part of this. We have to figure out ways to get infrastructure to the point where it can be both continuously delivered and self-rehearsing to the point where it becomes reliable and tunable so that the conductor is simply tweaking the experience for the, you know, the business experience for the end user, the consumer. Superb answer, thanks. Not to uh, overstress the metaphor, but having heard uh, the same piece performed by the same orchestra with different conductors on a number of occasions, the conductor makes much more difference than, uh, than you're implying. I think the important notion here is that there's a balance. There is considerable responsibility on the player, and there is considerable responsibility on the conductor. And the relevance to what we do is we need to make sure we find the right balance. The, you know, the conductor is not responsible for making sure that um, the person sitting in the 12th Sure, and the first violins plays every note exactly right. Um, but the conductor is there to keep everyone in the same place and to provide cues and to remind people of, of previous agreements about, um, about volume and tempo and so on. So there's a balance. That's the, that's the key thing. Yeah, I agree. And actually what's important in what you said is that the conductor is actually a person. 
He's not, I mean, the violin you could probably automate, but the conductor you couldn't. Because he's the one designing the business outcome. He is trying to create the experience based upon what he's hearing. And so that is definitely a, a human role and not a, a machine role. Tom. I promise not to ask anything about conductors. You said the word promise. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <clears throat> I was wondering if you feel, and if an analogy is taken too far, does it get absurd? No, actually, that wasn't my question. Um, it is about orchestration, though. It seems that when people talk about orchestration today, it's often telling individual machines uh, when to do things, but always getting to some uh, state. And there's a higher level orchestration, uh, and I guess, well, which is like, if you had to move a database, there are ordered things that have to happen. You can't, you know, maybe there's a load balancer that has to change. You certainly don't want to delete the old database before it's copied to the new one, things like that. Do you feel that that's part of orchestration, or does that is that a higher level of things that should have a different name? Great question. I, I take your point absolutely. I actually hate the term orchestration because it is so confused. Um, I don't like the idea of using the term orchestration for that because like rimsky korsakov I, I like to think of orchestration as being the, the design of the entire process at all times mm -hmm. and all places and all people. Um, sequential interventions, if we might call it that, I, I, I mean, they're kind of like, you know, adjusting the score somehow to, uh, to, make a, to bring about a change in a certain order. And obviously, uh, things have to be done in certain orders, but we also have to cope with parallelism. Uh, and this is the thing that I often find falls away when we talk about orchestration, because the focus becomes on sequences. I actually have a, a theory, which is that this sequen this, our fascination with doing things in order is really a human failing, excuse me, <clears throat> which comes about from language. We think in linear sequences because we tell stories to each other. We, we communicate in language, and language is linear. But when we try to automate things, we, we go through this process of starting out linear because we we're trying to enact the story, but then we figure out we don't need to do it linear. Actually, we can parallelize it. And it's only at that point that it becomes mature. So the real issues, I think, like you're saying, are where do things need to be done, where and when do things need to be done, and by whom, and designing that process in a way that uh, brings about or, or maintains business delivery, continuous delivery of business value, et cetera, et cetera. And what we call it, I don't care about. But what I'm concerned about is that we're too focused on ad hoc interventions rather than designing that process as a, as a kind of or orchestrated thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so you do feel it's a separate Thing or yeah, I, I, I do sort of feel it's a separate thing, but I'm not sure how to phrase it in a way that people will like. Or right. I'm not sure what the right words are to use for it. Yeah, I, I think that's the next set of things that we as a CM community need to talk about is like, how do we get you know, that level of stuff? And we need a vocabulary and stuff. I think the vac vocabulary is incredibly important because we're often trapped by these uh, buzzwords and phrases and yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any more? Well, thank you very much, everybody.